Uh, hello and good evening from Colombo and good morning and good afternoon from where anyone else is joining. Hello to everyone from Facebook. Nice to have you all here. It's been two very, very fantastic weeks. Uh, we've, this is the last day of our virtual summit on resilient and the food system. And we have our final, and as Dr. Mala said, probably the final discussion that we save for the end on inclusive partnerships for sustainable and regenerative food systems. Uh, the session will be moderated by Vinesha Rodrigo, who is the policy analyst and knowledge content developer for Slide and Chat. Uh, so, just a brief on both of the panelists before we get into the session. So we have Dr. Amanda Patili, who is joining us from Indonesia. She's the manager for Climate Reality Project in Indonesia, and also the co-founder of Oman Yodi Foundation, as well as Dr. Tukul Sugadapala, who's a senior consultant, climate change and sustainable development here at Site and Trust. Uh, so thank you, and I'll check in back again this, um, after the run of the session. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the session, and we'll make the best of it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sanasha. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Dineta Rodrigo. As uh, Sanasha said, I'm policy analyst and knowledge content developer at Slike and Trust. And um, it's great to be moderating the final session. And I definitely think that we have saved the best till last. And um, if I could uh, just start off with um, each of the panelists, uh, maybe giving a little bit more of a background into uh, their work and also maybe also the work that they've been doing on food systems, that would be a, a good start. Uh, Dr. Sugupal, would you like to go first? Yeah, okay, right. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, so I'm Tusita Sugupal, a senior consultant uh, at uh, uh, Psych and Trust, uh, working mainly on uh, sustainable development and uh, climate change aspect. So my background is I'm an engineer by profession working in an uh, uh, engineering uh, institute, uh, university, uh, 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 my uh, major trust area basically evolved around uh, energy and environment, uh, climate mitigation mainly. So uh, uh, I have been uh, instrumental in uh, uh, supporting uh, climate actions as well as sustainable development goals uh, in the local context in the recent uh, like uh, months, uh, uh, government of Sri Lanka has developed the strategy and uh, you know uh, the policy for sustainable development goals. Uh, so I have been involved there, and and also uh, presently I'm working on uh, mainstream in sustainable development goals for different uh, institutions, institutional levels, especially government institutions, and also localization of sustainable development goals, and uh, also uh, involved with the uh, Climate actions. Presently, national determined contributions are being updated. So I am working on two sectors uh, uh, mainly. Uh, one on uh, the uh, the waste sector. Other one is on transport. Uh, and also, I am giving some input to uh, uh, energy sector too. My uh, main involvement in food sector. I am not a, a specialist in food sector, but then uh, within these sustainable development goals, when we are localizing it and we are looking at this cross sectoral issues and so on. So that's where the food sector uh, come in. So with that, uh, I have some background food sector, but generally uh, my main emphasis on uh, climate actions, uh, NDCs and uh, sustainable development goals. So thank you. Thank you for that, Doctor. Um, and um, Dr. Amanda, would you like to also introduce yourself? Hi, um, hi, Dinetra, uh, Sanasia, and all the uh, Slight and Trust members. Thank you so much for the uh, professional organizing and also the exciting events with uh, top speakers from uh, all over the world. I'm Amanda Katilimiode. I'm the manager of the Climate Reality Project Indonesia. It's part of a global organization founded by Al Gore that mainstreams the issue of the climate crisis, uh, its solutions and action. And I'm also the co-founder of Omar Niode Foundation. It's a small nonprofit uh, working to raise awareness on local food, agriculture, and culinary arts in Indonesia. And I'm also a certified food and climate shaper from the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Future Food Institute. 
I just finished my terms as head of the expert team at the office of the President of the Republic of Indonesia Special Envoy for Climate Change. And for the last uh, 12 years, I have been a member of the Indonesian delegation to UNFCCC, the UN Climate Change Conference. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I think uh, for today's agenda, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Uh, Katsuri talking about partnerships in climate smart eating, followed by uh, Dr. Sugatapala, who will be focusing his uh, presentation on uh, inclusive part uh, action towards realization. Um, and I think he'll be touching on the SDGs as well as um, uh, actions toward real realization as well. So, um, and then after the two presentations, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, followed by uh, Senasha, who will be giving the closing remarks. So, uh, Dr. Katili, if we can uh, start with you, uh, that would be great. Right. I'll uh, share my screen and uh, please let me know whether uh, you can see it well. Can you see it? Yes. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. So uh, that's just the cover slide. And I would like to explain a little bit about the uh, climate project. As I mentioned earlier, it's a global organization. Right now, there are 31,000 climate reality leaders who have been trained by Al Gore and experts and activists. And they're residing in 170 countries. They are a diverse group of passionate individuals consisting of activists, cultural leaders, organizers, scientists, and storytellers committed to building a sustainable future together. And um, their age range, you wouldn't believe it, it's 12 to 87 years old. So everybody can work to address the climate crisis. Now with the Climate Reality Project Indonesia, our goals are to increase decision makers' awareness on climate crisis that lead to policies and programs and also empowering the next generation to understand and take action on climate change. Some of our activities have been on uh, food and climate because um, as you know, every food has a different carbon footprint. So our food choices and dietary choices can reduce the impact of climate change. With the depletion of natural resources, more and more consumers are choosing food as a way to support local culinary culture while protecting the earth. Now, there are uh, several studies and several works on climate smart eating and also the uh, regenerative food systems. Uh, I'm using the uh, Nature Conservancy's uh, definition. The uh, regenerative food system produce food, whether on land or at sea, in ways that actively restore habitat and protect biodiversity in and around production areas while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And in some cases, regenerative food systems can produce even more food than traditional systems. And crucially, they preserve the livelihoods of the farmers, fishers, ranchers, and others who work to provide our food now and in the long run. So I put some uh, measures or some activities related to uh, climate smart eating, but uh, basically a climate smart diet increases the consumption of whole grains, fruits and vegetables and reduces meat resulting in fewer greenhouse gases emission. Another way is to buy more local, local produce by transportation that is not too far away. It is also important to know whether the food is produced using climate smart agricultural techniques, namely agricultural strategies to secure sustainable food security in a changing climate. Uh, recently, there are some reports that work on this uh, issue, including the regenerative uh, food system as well as climate smart eating. I would like to mention a few. The recent one is bending the curve, the restorative power of planet-based diets by the WWF. And then uh, just last week, Al Gore uh, led a climate underground conference in his farms in Tennessee, focusing on the link between food system and the climate crisis, as well as how regenerative agriculture and soil health can fight climate change. And there are other um, activities as well. Now, these uh, things that I put here, uh, some measures contributing to climate uh, smart eatings. And 
including the avoid single-use plastic. And when we talk about uh, inclusive partnership, of course, we have to talk about state actors and non-state actors. And as we know, in every crisis, there are always opportunities. So there are lots of activities that could be developed from this uh, situation. Um, and I believe this is the gist of inclusive partnership. Uh, governments play an important role in promoting sustainable and regenerative food systems, especially through supportive policies. However, it is important to recognize the role of non-state actors to accelerate actions to build concrete, ambitious, and lasting cooperative initiatives. Now, the non-state actors, as we know, could be businesses, cities, regions, and other subnational entities, civil society, indigenous people, women, youth, and academic institutions. They may act as individual entities or in partnership with other stakeholders. There are some points of collaboration when you talk about partnership, but I would like to suggest herbs and spices because they're important for taste and these products are also affected by climate change. There are also neglected and underutilized species that are uh, resilient to extreme weather. And we also would like to stress uh, non-rice staple food as we know uh, most Asian countries rely on rice that could be the source of instability if the uh, supply or the production uh, is not enough. Next, I will give several examples of such partnerships for um, climate smart eating. Um, this is the International Forum on Spice Root. It's a partnership between the uh, Ministry of Education in Indonesia and an NGO, the Spice Root Foundation. But um, there are some uh, participants and some speakers from other countries as well, including the uh, ambassador of Sri Lanka to Indonesia and ASEAN. And it was highlighted that Sri Lanka, India, and Indonesia were key players in ancient trade routes between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. So Spice Root is an entry point in revisiting various possibilities for international cooperation, including food and agriculture. Um, the next one that I also would like to stress, uh, remember I mentioned about underutilized uh, species. Uh, some of you may be familiar with sago or the metroxylon sago is the uh, Latin name. It was identified as one of the most promising typical underutilized food crops with very little attention in the past. Um, it can grow up to 20 meters in, in height and produces a high yield of edible starch. It's about uh, 150 kilogram to 300 kilogram of, of dry starch per plant. And there are hundreds of culinary activities using sago starch as the main ingredient. The most important thing is sago palm can absorb a large amount of carbon dioxide to counteract climate change. Um, the next one is also a uh, cooperation. Uh, this is a cooperation between food and climate shapers. I mentioned about food and climate shapers earlier. It's a program by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Future Food Institute. And uh, several of us in um, India, Indonesia, and Lebanon is developing an app that enable farmers to sell their surplus and chefs to discover unique ingredients and producers know how. And components, of course, include collaboration, community resilience, and transparency. While sustainable development goals consider, you can see you know, from goal number one, two, eight, 10, 12, 13, 15, and um, 17. And um, we would like to test and refine the value propositions of that app. And we need assistance to reach more potential uh, uh, testers. Uh, this is a, a new partnership as well. It's, uh, I mean, ongoing right now. It's the European Union Climate uh, Diplomacy Week, because in mid-September, the European Commission proposed its lat latest package of climate actions, proposing to reduce EU greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 level which will put the EU on a balanced pathway to reaching climate neutrality by 2050. 
Now, their platform is the, EU, the EU Climate Diplomacy Week that uh, provides an opportunity for awareness raising and discussion on these themes between the EU and its member states and like-minded stakeholders. So there are lots of activities around the world, but in Indonesia, at least the climate project, uh, in Indonesia, there are 34 activities and still counting with more than 100 organizations involved. But the Climate Reality Indonesia is working on a climate smart recipe contest on Instagram. And uh, we are also going to have a talk show and cooking demo about climate smart eating, which is going to be on um, Sunday. I hope you all can make it. I'll put it on my social media. And you can see down below the uh, logos of the uh, uh, non-state actors involved in uh, trying to work to find the best information on climate smart eating because it's still new actually. And um, my last slide is actually a quotation from the state of food security and nutrition in the world, SOFI 2020. Uh, it says there that the adoption of healthy diets is projected to lead to a reduction up to 97% in direct and indirect health costs and 41 to 74% in the social cost of greenhouse gas emissions in 2030. Now, if you ask what a healthy diet is, according to Sophie, it ensures adequate calories and nutrition, but it includes a balanced diverse intake of foods from several different food groups. So it is intended to meet all requirements of nutrient uh, adequacy and help prevent uh, malnutrition in all its forms. So basically that's our idea about partnership in climate smart eating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatsidi. I think we all learned a lot, and even I have a few questions as well that um, I would like to ask in the Q&A session on uh, climate smart eating. I think especially to do with the uh, underutilized species of herbs and spices, I think that's also um, something that um, even in Sri Lanka that we have to promote as well, because we're, all, we're also uh, mainly growing um, uh, rice as our uh, main staple crop, and I think uh, looking at underutilized uh, species not only increases the chance of uh, growing crops which are more climate resilient but also you know to diversify our, uh, our diets as well and you know to, uh, to reduce our um, uh, dependency on um, livestock or uh, meats to reduce that too so uh, with that i would like to um, hand it over to dr sugathapala if he can um, Please uh, share his screen and presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Benetra. Yes, yeah. Hope you can see the presentation slide. Yes, it's nice. Thank you. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Slike and Trust, for arranging this uh, very important, I think, uh, series of uh, events uh, throughout the week. Uh, as they uh, repeated earlier, it's maybe the last date, but I think when you look at the whole. Uh, uh, sessions uh, conducted so far, it's very clear the uh, importance of uh, food systems, especially regenerative food systems for sustainability. And then uh, there are many, uh, you know, complexity has been highlighted and also many solutions uh, derived uh, through different partnerships and uh, different interventions have been highlighted. So what I want to talk today uh, with my presentation is to uh, see how we could uh, implement these actions, maybe national level, maybe uh, local level, uh, maybe even the regional level, uh, that uh, our targets are best achieved. So, uh, so that's why the title is given as actions towards realization, uh, especially highlighting uh, the big picture and then how we could uh, make sure that the governments and you know, the uh, policymakers could uh, take these uh, messages and then uh, implement these activities. So I will talk about these four uh, areas, the big picture within the sustainability uh, uh, dimension, the goals, uh, the basis for especially looking at this collaboration, the partnerships, effective partnerships, then uh, what are the actions towards uh, the realization of these partnerships towards achieving the goals, and lastly, uh, the concluding remarks, uh, some of the key uh, maybe uh, requirements for us to go forward. Uh, basically, uh, this topic uh, is evolved 
uh, around uh, the sustainable development goals and also 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So you look at this uh, basic framework, uh, it's very clear the role of uh, food, not only because of its uh, prominence in uh, goal number two, the zero hunger, but also appearing in implicitly uh, throughout uh, other goals, uh, from ending uh, poverty to climate change or climate action, then build resilience, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, sustaining natural resources. That's, uh, that's uh, food and agriculture lies at the heart of the 2030 agenda. So that's been uh, repeatedly I think, uh, indicated uh, throughout the week uh, when you had these deliberations. So, it's clear. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, one way of, uh, maybe the best way of looking at this uh, issue, uh, the, uh, the challenge, by looking at the SDGs itself, its basic framework and also the principles. Even the, uh, the need for partnership or inclusive partnerships uh, can be clearly seen the big picture. So uh, you can see here uh, the core principles of uh, SDGs itself. Uh, indicate the uh, key elements we are talking about, for example, inclusiveness and also partnership, and to also indicate the interconnected uh, connections and interconnected and uh, indivisible nature of the SDGs, mean that food does not just lie in the food sector, but it cut across many other areas, uh, especially uh, when you look at sustainable dimensions, we talk about planet, people, and prosperity, uh, yeah, which uh, include basically the environment, the society and the economy, but it's reinforced by the partnership. So this uh, one of the major, you know, new dimensions came within the stages uh, is the need for partnership. So therefore we can see uh, how uh, this partnership and also inclusiveness uh, can, uh, you know, play a role uh, in uh, sustainable uh, food uh, and agriculture sectors or regenerative agriculture sectors. So. Uh, so therefore we can conclude that, uh, we can highlight that inclusive partnership is uh, central for sustainable and regenerative uh, food systems. So, uh, so the solution we are looking at, not only targeting a particular sector, uh, it, it cut across many uh, multiple dimensions, core benefits and so on. So that's the, the context under which we have to look at the partnership itself. So uh, now when you look at the approach, it's again highlighted within the stages, uh, the framework, uh, it's uh, within these SDGs, the core principles, uh, it can be clearly seen that uh, the two approaches, one is whole of government approach where all the, you know, the ministries or public administrations and other agencies at different level, national, maybe local level, should work together as a single organization to facilitate synergies, manage trade-offs, avoid or minimize negative spillovers. So we can see here, we are talking about partnership within uh, government institutions, uh, one way. Secondly, it's also talk about whole of society approach. They are the multi-step the partnership is highlighted, uh, which cut across the government, uh, state sector, public, uh, private, uh, civil society, NGOs, even uh, international bodies, all like uh, act in collaboration as a single entity uh, uh, in a meaningful way to achieve effective implementation of into major we will follow up of uh, 2030 agenda, including the food sector. So, so we can see these are the basic, uh, you know, the basic uh, on which uh, the SDGs are also developed and also to be implemented. So therefore, uh, the clear indication is there the importance of the partnership, which uh, basically go beyond the typical partnerships. We are talking about uh, cutting across many, you know, aspects. So uh, we can uh, look at this uh, the complex uh, system of partnership uh, in a more structured way uh, by looking at the uh, different elements. So, uh, so with that uh, also we can look at why uh, uh, this uh, become important because we have a lack of partnership. So that's why we it's, has become a, a kind of a one of the SDGs uh, because uh, uh, for the last, uh, you know, look at the, uh, the progressions in SDGs so far as well as earlier interventions one of the challenges is still uh, the lack of partnership. So, so, so one of the issues, some of the issues uh, which uh, give rise to this lack of partnerships, uh, basically uh, in our part of the world, especially, we have multi-layer of governance with uh, little interface for interaction. 
of course, then we have like a coordination and communication between different institutions and for different government uh, governance levels. The policy uh, formulation itself is uh, in, uh, coherent uh, and decision making too. Uh, then we really uh, shared information, uh, so data information resources, that's another issue. And also we have this uh, limited interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity or even transdisciplinarity, so that the expected, you know, the outcome uh, are very difficult to achieve. So even uh, the lack of these are uh, basically due to uh, lack of partnership. So, so this highlight uh, so far how far we are uh, disconnected, uh, and 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 then uh, with that uh, there are counterproductivity like because of that we have distrust, disbelief, and ignorance uh, among stakeholders and you know uh, institutions, uh, and with that we have inefficient and ineffective resource utilization, uh, and also there's absence of institution set up or buy-in uh, payment for indicated analysis and planning. Uh, throughout this session, we can we have seen that uh, the, the most of success stories came up with a good partnership, uh, very strong partnership in multi stakeholder you know, involvement uh, uh, and integrated approach, uh, especially looking at this particular system thinking. Uh, but then uh, most of the actions, uh, activities we have taken uh, are not, uh, you know, around system thinking. So that's another issue. And also we have a limited localization aspect. So sometimes we try to adopt certain, you know, uh, even some best practices without looking at the, the localization aspect or the local circumstances. So therefore most of these uh, even technologies, uh, which supposed to be uh, like a best practice in some part of the world, but become failure in local context uh, because of this uh, uh, limited localization. So, uh, so those are the uh, issues which arise, which has arisen uh, through, uh, you know, lack of partnership. So, uh, so that we address these issues, of course, we have to address these issues to tackle uh, these uh, global challenges. Uh, thus, we need the partnerships uh, by looking at these, uh, you know, uh, the different areas. So one way of, uh, you know, trying to see is by, uh, you know, capturing all these dimensions in a, in a single frame, uh, that's the modality for this. We can look at uh, there are different sectors uh, like, for example, we look at the food and agriculture. That today's uh, topic It's not only food and agriculture. There are many other cost-cutting areas, sectors, and domains uh, which are linked to that. We have to capture those. Uh, then, of course, uh, we have different stakeholders, uh, which has been highlighted earlier too: uh, stake uh, sector, non-state sector, power sector. In cutting, of course, many many uh, you know dimensions there too. Uh, in going into even general public uh, communities and so on. Then of course we look at the different governance levels from local, maybe subnational or national, and go, go beyond that regional and global level. So when we talk about these stakeholders, uh, all are there basically, all these dimensions. So we look at the partnerships, even uh, we have to capture that. So therefore, the basic uh, underlying principle behind SDG is to set up this, you know, whole of government and whole of society to capture this uh, together. So therefore, this whole of society and whole of government concept basically is linked to basically stakeholder engagement, which include the stakeholders as well as, you know, institutions and, and so on. Uh, so therefore, uh, stakeholder engagement become fundamental to success of any interventions, any, any uh, intervention we uh, try to implement uh, in any uh, issues uh, should uh, have this stakeholder engagement captured in all these, you know, uh, aspects, whole of society and whole of government approach. Uh, therefore, it's not uh, different to uh, even sustainable uh, and regenerative food system. So effective implementation of this uh, intervention we talk about uh, for sustainable and regenerative food system should have a very strong uh, stakeholder engagement from uh, the beginning, basically from even I find the interventions or the issues towards the implementation and you know, uh, follow up. So therefore, it's very important uh, to understand that the 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 this uh, the role of uh, you know partnership, the inclusive partnership, for success of uh, these uh, interventions. Um, now, when you look at the stakeholder engagement, uh, these are not uh, new. There are structured way of doing it. Uh, so that even in a, a single project or maybe a program, maybe even national level, uh, we have look at that uh, basically how to engage stakeholders. Uh, in fact, the partnerships. Uh, will be evolved through this type of a stakeholder analysis and stakeholder engagement. 
we can usually uh, categorize this one into three levels, the design platform uh, to uh, you know, set the, uh, the stakeholder uh, you know, engagement process and then uh, planning and final implementation uh, so that at the end, uh, you will have a, a, a multi the partnerships in place uh, to uh, effectively implement the, the focus activities uh, so that uh, everyone, uh, no one left behind and everyone become partners, everyone become owners, and everyone will contribute to the, the actions. So, and also the finally share the results. So, so that type of approach has to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, used if you want to, uh, you know, make any interventions, uh, especially, uh, you know, sustainable food and uh, regenerative agriculture systems. Uh, uh, for example, now, uh, uh, when you look at the stakeholder, engagement, one of the major elements is to map the stakeholders. So we look at uh, their roles and responsibilities, their interests and influence. So we can identify how to, uh, you know, uh, handle these uh, stakeholders. So uh, one of the example here I'm highlighting there is uh, to map uh, uh, the different stakeholders uh, based on their levels of interest and level of influence. The level of interest basically means that uh, the, it portrays the relevancy and focus of actors. Uh, on the area of concern, for example, in this particular case, the sustainable food and uh, regenerative agriculture system, the influence, basic level of influence, uh, characterizes the power of the actor to impact upon any action. So, so we need uh, people uh, with uh, influence uh, who can make the decision, decision makers, as well as uh, having interest, uh, so that they genuinely participate in the process. So we can map different, you know, stakeholders uh, based on this level of interest and level of influence. So we have a category where uh, we have high level of interest and high level of influence. That's this area. Basically, mean that uh, these are the most important stakeholders. We have to manage closely and we have to work together. So those are the most potential uh, uh, stakeholders for partnership because they uh, have the power and also they have the interest. Uh, then, of course, other stakeholders are important. Uh, now we look at this one, they have the influence, but not much interest, low interest. For them, uh, we have to have a strategy so that they have to keep them satisfied so that they will no, not oppose our activities and also keep them informed so that we can always, uh, you know, uh, may, they may not uh, fully support, but they will not oppose also. But of course, if we can move them to the high level of interest, that's also important. So this side, for example, we are, they have high interest, but then uh, no, not much uh, influence. So they don't have influence or power, uh, but uh, then uh, they are interested. So therefore, this is also important uh, group. We can consult them to get, uh, you know, ideas uh, or, you know, feedback and so on. And we have to keep them informed. And lastly, we have this group where they have low interest and low influence. Uh, usually, we don't have to spend much effort, uh, uh, you know, time or resources for them. But we have to monitor them because we have to keep uh, them, you know, uh, understand their, 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 their issues and so on. So that's the way we try to, you know, figure out the stakeholders uh, and thereby we can identify when it is set up uh, partnerships, you know, how to, uh, you know, get engaged with these partners, how to select the partners and then what their roles and so on. So that type of analysis are important, uh, you know, for partnership, but then stakeholder, uh, you know, the, the management or consultation. Uh, go, go beyond partnerships, basically a very important requirement for implementation of any activities. Uh, the concluding remarks basically that uh, now uh, this basically go beyond uh, the, the stakeholders also, uh, but basically for, for, to have, you know, the, uh, the successful or the, uh, you know, inclusive partnership, uh, one of the major uh, requirements is uh, enabling policy and institutional environment. So we have to uh, really identify the stakeholders, especially national level and policy making level, and look at their, you know, the gaps and so on to address the issues. Uh, so we have to make them, you know, the policy and institutional environment uh, conducive to the actions. Then we have to have opportunities for stakeholder engagement. That's what we discussed earlier, especially for localization or prioritization and implementation of different interventions. We have to have competency ecosystem, the sound competency ecosystem, like knowledge and skills. Uh, to foster the, the, the fact-based decision-making as well as effective implementation of actions through what you call knowledge management, the knowledge, uh, you know, what you have this uh, knowledge creation application together. We need innovation ecosystem because we are looking at transformational changes, so we uh, need innovations there. So that ecosystem should be in place uh, to nature, creativity, and also new ways of and means of uh, in addressing key challenges 
is also uh, related to uh, the uh, setting up partnerships you know the, we need innovative ideas innovative ways of uh, you know having partnerships and also even the technology transfer thing is very important to understand that technology transfer is very important aspect uh, uh, for 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 you know addressing challenges and finally uh, whatever the case we need the financing in place so the effective financing especially through harnessing public resources and mobilizing uh, private investments is very important even for uh, run a uh, you know good uh, partnerships this become very important so we have to see uh, in a partner how we can partner in with uh, not only public sector but also private sector and then how to you know mobilize the resources uh, to make sure make uh, you know effective financing for implementation of activities so with that i will uh, conclude uh, just to highlight some of the key elements uh, required for partnerships uh, for uh, for uh, sustainable food and uh, regenerative agriculture systems thank you thank you dr sudapala um and now i think uh, we can move on swiftly to the q and a session uh, now i can already see that there's um one question in the q and a box um if everyone uh, could feel free to uh, just drop any questions into either the chat box or the q and a session that would be great so i'd start with the first question that we've uh, had which is i think uh, to both panelists maybe uh, dr katili can uh, take this first um how do you explain the dynamic nature of balanced meals with sufficient protein intake versus climate smart pla uh, plant based meal habits could i answer now yes that would yeah be okay so uh, the keyword is habit that's um, exactly true that's what we have uh, to work on some uh, scientific evidence um, already spread across uh, scientific papers but then again how do we change the habit that's why uh, the climate reality project indonesia we are concentrating on events on uh, activities on proof on how it looks like you know the uh, plant based diets and um, basically what the uh, wwf said as a uh, planet based diet it's uh, discouraging overconsumption of food to the extent that overconsumption negatively impact biodiversity the environment human and health and then like i said again reducing overconsumption of animal source foods by increasing the relative consumption of uh, plant based foods confers both environmental and health benefit but how do we make uh, people believe in that uh, that's why there are lots of activities and uh, taste is important that's why i mentioned taste and uh, emphasizing on the role of herbs and spices but uh, there are some activists that really would like to have it uh, to make it into an international convention especially the food system if we have uh, united nations framework convention on climate change we have the united nations uh, development goals why don't you have why don't you have the united nations uh, regenerative food system for example so uh, again like i said state actors and non state actors they are uh, playing a role but uh, right now of course there are some challenges uh, to do that but if we can come up with proof with actions with samples examples and about 50 organizations are are doing it uh, right now if i'm not mistaken because uh, you know we get Uh, lots of uh, information lots of invitation uh, to join or to uh, promote this uh, climate smart activities thank you very much um does uh, dr sudapal have any uh, comments to add on yeah uh, yeah just to add on to that uh, one of the element basically we are talking about uh, you know the change in lifestyle basically because uh, you know presently uh, we have uh, like uh, moved away from the sustainability concept within even eating habits so uh, so so one of the major element there is what you call knowledge you know knowledge cycle basically and also talking, uh, talking about these uh, competencies which go beyond uh, knowledge and skill we talk about attitudes and values so we need uh, try to inculcate those uh, within education systems and within the general you know public the communities i think uh, some of these best practices can be easily you know taken into uh, right you know uh, to the society 
another aspect is the indigenous knowledge like uh, some of the like the knowledge we talk about usually we go by sometime you know what we learn from the schools and you know education program but the knowledge go beyond that when you get especially uh, this topic the balanced meal and also climate smart plants and so on this has been used by the communities for years and years especially you know uh, in indigenous communities for example we should be able to capture those and then only thing is you can't just uh, you can't use this on one to one but then we have to come up with uh, you know best practices some you know solutions adaptable to local context so that's where we need the capacity in you know, the competencies the knowledge uh, the, the sharing of information uh, the communication of course uh, you know media so that's where the again partnership come in there so the, the governments and so on you know we have to uh, use those uh, you know information and then uh, like data and make it information and then uh, we have to you know educate the the, the 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 communities and also we have to have solution in place like you know we have to show that this work so therefore that's where the government can play a major role that these things can be you know piloted and then uh, show that like so that it should uh, mainly come through the society itself the solution can come to the society but uh, personally we don't have system in place to capture those knowledge so that's why we, we need this uh, knowledge ecosystem the innovations and so on should come in so uh, so uh, so we need this uh, holistic approach there there too yeah. thank you thank you dr gopal um uh we also have an, another question which is to uh, dr uh, kartili which is uh, what are some uh, policy steps governments can take to promote climate smart eating and are there any examples from indonesia or other asian countries that you know of right that's that's a uh, very interesting uh, one that we would like to see right away you know policies on climate smart eating but uh, i believe uh, there are none right now but uh, traditionally you know at least in indonesia our food is climate smart you know lots of uh, vegetables plant based and uh, you know just um, using ingredients that are available locally uh, less on meat for sure but with the uh, globalization then people are beginning to uh, eat lots of uh, uh, animal based uh, food uh, it's not wrong but um, what some of the regional governments are doing right now is back to traditional food uh, like I said, uh, mostly are climate smart, and some regions have their policy. You know, it's a, a material to be in school curriculum to understand their uh, traditional food. So that helps. Although on a national uh, scale, it's not on. Uh, it's not a policy on climate smart eating, but uh, high-ranking officials are doing some campaigns. For example, eat more fish eat more vegetables, although it's not mentioned as climate smart eatings, but the elements are there, especially going back to uh, traditional food. But um, of course, we cannot uh, go back to like uh, 100 or 200 years ago, but uh, showing the uh, delightfulness of the uh, dishes and the uh, different plating. So chefs, uh, play an important role in this, you know, showing different platings and colors and government officials encouraging the people to eat uh, more fish and more vegetables. Not in terms of laws and uh, policy yet. Thank you, Dr. Katili. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Sugadapala, uh, which is uh, referring to the stakeholder engagement uh, map that you showed with the uh, influence, the uh, relationship between influence and interest. So um, what are the steps uh, someone can take or what can be done to move someone who's, let's say, in a low interest, uh, high influence category into the uh, high interest, high influence category. Yeah. Um, now, uh, basically, uh, there are two things. One thing is sometimes we are looking at the institution rather than people. Uh, but then, of course, uh, uh, the people also important. For example, at the decision making level, in a ministry or uh, institution, maybe the head of the institution and so on, at a personal level too. So that we have to first understand what's the objective. We are looking at whether. Uh, the institution or we are looking at uh, within the institution staff. So, so usually when you look at that, 
uh, first first look at the institution whether uh, as a mandate whether they have a, a mandate on that topic you know so particularly say food so uh, so if they don't have mandate so then you know you can't do much there but but then uh, we can look at you know uh, how to you know make their interest more by providing information and so on so uh, so secondly when you go for uh, the staff level we usually go by three levels uh, what we call the strategic level tactical and operational level because uh, each of these will have their own uh, you know uh, role the strategic level they have what we call the uh, you know policy making and planning thing but when you go operational level for example they are maybe basically just uh, maybe you know implementing programs and so on so tactical level they are talking about planning maybe implementation together so by looking at then you can you know see uh, uh, a particular position as well as their individual characteristics so basically uh, through a consultation like you know we we provide information uh, based on their gaps you know and sometime uh, when it's a kind of institutional level we try to and we can have a you know training program maybe one session to make them aware and so on so the first thing is make them aware so that they may not have any negative or like you know we are not really you know you know teaching something wrong but you know we are we are giving the facts correct you know so 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 we had to start from there the knowledge uh, the awareness then we go for knowledge and then uh, of course skills and so on is stage by stage process so the first thing is we have to start with the awareness thing so okay thank you very much um the next question i have is for uh, dr katili uh, and i uh, it's uh, referring to the uh, herbs and spices and underutilized uh, species that you were talking about so um how can uh, we encourage farmers to grow these uh, you know uh, underutilized species and have more herbs and spices and what partnerships do you think would help in this uh, uh, process for example you know would it help that the government uh, uh, helps farmers through maybe giving them government subsidies or you know connecting farmers with uh enterprises or smes who can um give them agriculture new agricultural technology to increase production or make uh, production more efficient what kind of partnerships do you think would help to encourage farmers to grow more of these underutilized uh, species and herbs and spices well where was the question i didn't see it in the chat room uh, sorry, this one, uh, this one was uh, my one. I haven't typed. It. Oh, okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's it's very interesting because uh, at least in Indonesia, uh, the government is very much invo involved in raising the awareness and of uh, you know these herbs and spices. And we do have areas, uh, you know, the spice islands, very famous in Indonesia. We do have uh, spice islands and spice areas, and. Um, uh, again, it's an inclusive partnerships where mostly universities are also working with the uh, farmers and uh, foundations. Uh, like I mentioned, the uh, there are several foundations in Indonesia they are also working on that, and also the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. They've been having um, lots and lots of uh, activities to encourage that. But uh, you are right. I mean, the comment and the question is is really. Uh, justifiable in that the uh, the key is the farmer i mean not you know all kinds of uh, activities that are you know romanticizing the herbs and spices no the key uh, the keys are the um, the uh, farmers and um, how to cut the middleman so that's uh, how some organizations are working on it so that they will get the uh, fair trade in the uh, herbs and spices that uh, they're growing. But uh, right now with the pandemic, uh, the government is encouraging um, home-based garden on herbs and, and spices. So it's a, a government policy a government encouragement in uh, herbs and spices first to uh, really supply the herbs and spices for the uh, family for the uh, family first and then if you have uh, surplus then you can also distribute it or sell it to others uh, why herbs and spices are important and it's very popular in indonesia because uh, it, we call it herbal medicine um, i believe in india in sri lanka also there are lots of uh, herbal drinks, uh, you know, for all kinds of uh, remedies and uh, for all kinds of um, uh, diseases. 
not only for food, but also for health. That's why herbs and spices are very uh, popular in Indonesia. Uh, thank you for that, Doctor. Um, does Dr. Uh, Sugadapal have anything to add to that, or shall we move on to the... Uh, not really, yeah. Okay, um, then uh, we also have a question for Dr. Sugadapal on the chat box. Yes. Uh, which reads, while stakeholder engagement is fundamental to the process when considering building these partnerships, especially in the context of uh, sustainable and regenerative food systems, how do you uh, go about trying to overcome the challenges that you mentioned? Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, basically, this step of, uh, you know, can be explained by, uh, you know, example. So I, I will take one example, like uh, there's something happened in the University, like, uh, you know, we have a First thing is we have to have a, a forum uh, for engagement. So uh, in, in the universities now uh, with the government initiative, we have what we call this university business linkage cell, where anyone can come and then raise their issues. So we have a person there to attend to that. So so people come there, like even maybe uh, like we had a case where there's a farmer came uh, because he won't need a solution for water supply. So like lift irrigation. So, but then he had some particular Co pattern uh, of uh, like uh, basically we can think about regenerative food system within that also like uh, multiple coping and so on. Uh, so then uh, the problem came as uh, you know he needs he said he need a solar water pump. So just a technology. But then uh, when you look at uh, his he had uh, like around 50 acres. So when you analyze it, we, we found that you know uh, the technology is not uh, suitable for that land. And 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 of course this problem is not just that technology. So. So in that forum, we, we, it's, it's grew into a different level and, and finally came up with um, some other problems. Like we, we are in fact problem is not just water there. So, so, so the partner is just not you know, you know, having that interrelation. So it evolved to a certain level. And then uh, of course uh, we had uh, in a connections, partnership with others. For example, uh, we had a, a, like, uh, we have a laboratory uh, uh, funded by uh, one of these uh, leading agency, uh, uh, where where the food products like so 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 when we talk about them so they are willing to take up their that, that particular farmers product for supermarkets so so we, we link that you know so uh, uh, and then uh, there's an issue that they have to maintain a quality so now that uh, capacity was not with the farmer so so then uh, we had the startup uh, who were uh, developing some apps you know uh, to to, to uh, you know, manage some resources and so on. So we link them to that and so on. So it's evolving process. So, so therefore, when we have a forum to engage, uh, uh, you know, uh, first thing is that even the problem can, you know, identify better. So, uh, so therefore, uh, I think it depends upon the, uh, like we don't have a, you know, single solution there. But when you have this forum for partnerships and, 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 and we listen to people, uh, then, then of course, uh, we can develop uh, to a very, uh, you know, successful partnerships. Which is uh, you should go beyond the initial you know, requirements. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I think uh, on the uh, idea of apps and mobile apps and how it can help you know uh, inclusive partnerships as well as uh, uh, climate smart eating and uh, sustainable food and regenerative systems. There was there's an app in the UK called uh, Too Too Good to Go, and mm -hmm. what it basically does it it links uh, consumers with uh, restaurants who have um, mm -hmm. so it's a, a, it's to help um manage food waste and uh, food waste management and so for example if uh, uh restaurants have uh uh extra uh food that they haven't uh, been able to sell they can uh, sell it for much cheaper on the app and so what 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 steps do you think uh, i think this is a question to uh both panelists uh what do you think can be done to help you know uh uh kind of start these initiatives and also uh, help them grow as well as what kind of partnerships would be helpful for these uh, kind of startups and initi initiatives to uh, uh, grow, especially with to do with technology and apps and how it can help climate smart eating and sustainable food systems. Uh, if uh, Dr. Kathili would like to start and then. Yeah. Right. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on uh, developing an app that could help uh, farmers as well as chefs uh, connect. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy because um, we have to do uh, lots of tests and lots of uh, steps 
especially the uh, value propositions. And then we also have to think about the uh, startup funding first. What we did in our initial steps are interviewing the stakeholders, you know, the chefs, the farmers, and then also um, about the uh, technology. And uh, of course, uh, Mo said that uh, right now the applicable one is uh, WhatsApp messages. So, because it would be difficult for, for some to go to a website or even a smartphone. So uh, we're thinking about the, um, the easiest uh, technology available uh, that could be done. And um, also, the uh, I would like to give you an example, um, especially in Indonesia, in using this uh, kind of app where uh, small businesses are trying to uh, market their products because right now you can only do e-commerce, right, with the uh, pandemic. There has to be a, a mentoring for the uh, small businesses, for the small farmers, even on how to use your cell phone, uh, even how to sign up to the app. And uh, some companies who have this online market uh, have a what they call a school. For example, there's an app called X. So sometimes there's an X university, X school, X academy, where they first have to educate the users. Uh, before you know marketing their platform and it takes time and they go to the villages you know um, uh, trying to make them understand how to uh, market their products even how to take pictures of of the products and then uh, bringing some success stories to uh, small farmers uh, we work on uh, with coffee farmers and with uh, spices farmer of a certain uh, spices which is a uh, Sichuan uh, spice um, it's uh, the steps are almost similar. You really have uh, to educate them uh, step by step. And we could work with uh, a private sector or companies in the area. But again, of course, the country is very big. We would like to have more, uh, even ministries, uh, ministry of uh, uh, small business is also involved, but the country is too big and we need uh, you know, we need to learn the ropes and the step-by-step uh, -step action. But, um, but it's going to be successful, I'm sure, because the online market said that their sales is increasing like a thousand percent with uh, these small businesses uh, being involved. Thank you for that, Dr. Katli. Uh, Dr. Sagarapala? Yeah, um, so uh, like not only for food sector, but in general, we are entrepreneurships and startups we have to have a supportive system. Uh, for example, Sri Lanka, we don't have that, but it's coming up now. For example, uh, I said it earlier, we have what you call universities now, what you use business decay sell. They're supposed to uh, groom uh, the uh, entrepreneurs, uh, especially within the university, but of course we are looking at uh, the outside also. Uh, so we have a panel of mentors as uh, Amada indicated, we need expertise to guide them. So it, 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 they, are, they, they, are don't, they don't charge basically, they're just you know, giving the you know, social responsible aspect and then they are supporting it. In fact, we are also getting some uh, you know, uh, you know, professional uh, input from other countries like US, uh, WIPO, World Internet Property Organization, they have some training program for us and they have appointed members for selected uh, you know, these startups to, uh, to uh, bring it to the market. So, so that type of systems are available. Uh, uh, a person like there are around 15 projects in Sri Lanka mentored by uh, WIPO. Uh, they assign uh, you know, mentor and every month we have this Skype call and then uh, they guide a selected entrepreneur, you know, develop their product and then market and then see you know, how we can for go forward. Sometimes what they said is, you know, they, they, we don't like, maybe uh, the individual startup you know, cannot uh, survive in the market. So they, uh, you know, uh, give the guidance to, you know, uh, link up with a major company and keep a royalty and then, you know, sell it, you know, something like that. So it's dependent upon the, again, situation, situation. So we need a professional, you know, guidance for them. And some of the cases, uh, they are linked to, uh, you know, IPI, uh, IPR, into property right. So it's become, again, a complex topic. Uh, unless we are a big company, you know, you don't have that expertise or whatever to even file a case. So in, 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 in this setup now, uh, we, we are supporting those also, and we are getting uh, legal you know, support also uh, with free sometime for that type of entrepreneurs to you know, you know, uh, 
put up the ip uh, get the ip rights and so on so so that type of uh, you know support should be there basically so uh, so that has to be you know basically driven by the government uh, in sri lanka we is happening now and uh, uh, some extent and then especially linking the university as well as r and d institutions so another one is like some of the products we have to test like so uh, the, the facilities some the testing facilities are they are and also is costly so unless we have some type of partnership you know uh, very difficult for startup to you know uh, do that uh, you know so because uh, without having testing and certification thing you can't market it so that's why they have to collaborate with other you know agencies and also maybe another company uh, by keeping their their royalty whatever you know so so for that there are guidance like so so there are very standard procedures to be followed so in the university system now we have that type of uh, entities uh, what you call university system uh, you know link itself where they are they are they are they are they are supporting this type of activity even for outside you know parties thank you for that dr rupal and i think uh, with that we've reached our uh, time limit um it's been a pleasure to uh, moderate this session with uh, both dr kathri and dr sugata palas so i'm going to uh, hand it over back to sanasha to uh, give their closing remarks and again thank you very much thank you uh, thanks sinestra and thanks dr kathri and dr sugata palas um i think we ended on the right note and i'm very very we are all very grateful for the both of you also making time and for also engaging with us during the past two sessions as well uh i think these the these past two weeks at least i'm, I'm sure it has been for everyone but it's been very insightful we've learned so much especially about bringing in different aspects and i think we've all been working in silos so it's always nice to bring all of these aspects together uh so just to let everyone know if anyone have missed out on our previous sessions uh the we've been uploading them on youtube because these sessions are recorded and we will also be doing a few longer posts on this much later on our website likeandtrust.org so yes so with that if you all want to hear more information about us i'm also going to drop a uh, email address on the chat so please do connect with us stay in touch i think the way forward is actually building these <laughs> partnerships um connecting with others from across the globe especially in asia i think because we all have very similar <coughs> yet different um uh concerns we have similar issues we have similar sort of government structures and same problems so it's always nice to connect with others from the region and share knowledge and expertise so with that we wrap up a virtual week it's been such a pleasure uh, being also able to moderate this it's been such a great <coughs> learning experience uh, thank you everyone for joining and especially thank you dr sugatha and dr kathiri for their for making time um it's always nice to have you all guiding us and you know sharing your knowledge with us thank you dinestra for thank moderating and uh, yes so with that um we end the virtual week and we will see you all soon thank you very much thank you everybody thank you thank you bye bye